This is a Cross and Crown Church production. For other resources, please visit crosscrownchurch.com. Book title, The Kingdom Driven Life. Author, Sunday at Elijah. Published by Cornerstone Publishing. Copyright 2015. Narrated by Jason Garwood. Dedication to the next generation of believers who are tired of the status quo. Those who no more want to do church as usual. Those who thirst and hunger for something more from Christianity. I pray that God will satisfy your hunger through this humble effort. Forward. Seldom in a person's life are they an eyewitness to a turning point in history. You have in front of you a very special book. I believe this is one of the top three books written in the last 1,000 years. In my opinion, it is definitely the best book on the kingdom of God. Let me tell you a bit about how I felt when I first met Pastor Sunday. He is an unusual man. I find him to be an exceptional man of God. World leaders and church leaders have honored Pastor Sunday. Even U.S. President Bill Clinton, in a private moment, told Pastor Sunday that he appreciated the work he was doing. Most importantly, Pastor Sunday has been called and directed by God to extend his kingdom. Lasting fruit is the evidence of this. Pastor Sunday believes God has made everyone for a particular and unique purpose. We understand that purpose when we understand the passions that motivate us. By following those passions, we can fulfill our kingdom destiny and take the good news of the kingdom into the sphere of influence where our passion is leading us. Our passions are God-given and help us understand the purposes that God made us to fulfill. God wants you to fulfill the particular purpose for which He created you. He has put passions in your heart to help you connect in the areas that He has designed you to impact. This book tells you how to discover your destiny and take kingdom principles to spheres that perhaps only you can address. God has a unique calling for you. That calling is your destiny. The kingdom-driven life tells you how to fulfill your destiny. My wife and I were on the platform with Pastor Sunday in Kiev, Ukraine. We were there for a great celebration. Why were we there on the platform for this great celebration? This is a fact of life. Every great man has enemies. Pastor Sunday has enemies. The reason I was on the platform was because I wanted to affirm the fruit from Pastor Sunday's ministry that I was seeing right in front of my own eyes. Jesus said, By their fruits you will know them. And let me tell you about the fruit. At that very celebration, we saw wave after wave of people come to the stage and share what God had done through their lives. They are bringing in a great harvest, the likes of which I have never heard of or seen. These people were testimony of the fruit that Pastor Sunday's ministry has borne. The fruit of this ministry is exceptionally good fruit. All spheres of society are being impacted. Millions are coming to know Christ. The face of politics is being renewed in righteousness. Businesses are being started by believers and are flourishing, and social ills are being addressed. Just one example is that 10,000 people have been set free from addiction to drugs and alcohol. This isn't just a small harvest, it is an abundant harvest. When this type of harvest comes in, we call it revival. That is what I saw in Ukraine. I saw revival, the harvest coming in like I have never seen it come in before. The gospel of salvation is extremely powerful. This is where the road divides when I compare what is happening in Ukraine to many of the accounts that I've heard about in other sections of the world. What is different? Let's take a look at the United States. We experienced revival. It left us with a church on every street corner. But culture is not being impacted. Too many of the efforts I've heard about leave the churches full and culture unchanged. When the good news went forward in the first century, it turned the world upside down. This is what happened to Pastor Sunday in Ukraine. He built Europe's first and largest megachurch. He had 15,000 people in his megachurch, but what was the outcome? Pastor Sunday looked at culture and realized that even though his church was growing large and healthy, the general society was not being impacted. This started Pastor Sunday on a new journey. 
That journey was to understand the principles of the kingdom and how they related to culture. That is the key difference between this work and many other works that I have seen. This work is built on living out the good news of the kingdom, not just proclaiming the good news of salvation. Of course we need the good news of salvation, but we are saved from one place to another place. We are saved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We ought to realize that Jesus talked more about the kingdom than any other thing. Somehow we have drifted from our purpose that Jesus left for us. That purpose is to impact all spheres around us with the good news of the kingdom. This is the purpose that we are saved to. What has happened in the United States is that we have churches on every street corner, but we have lost the understanding of how to impact culture. In the New Testament, when the good news went forth, they turned the world upside down. That is what is happening in Ukraine. I believe that God has raised up Pastor Sunday to change history. It's not every day that you meet someone who history will record as being at the forefront of a change as significant as the Reformation. Yet, should the Lord tarry, I believe this is how history will be written. If Jesus does not come back in our generation, I think you will see a book entitled Pastor Sunday, The Man, The Myth, The Legend. And I'm sure that this book will document a change in eras. That change will be from our current era where people focus on building their church. We could call this the church era. The new era will be when churches focus on extending the kingdom of God. I believe this new era will be called the kingdom era. I believe we are entering the kingdom era. Pastor Sunday and the people he has equipped to live the kingdom-driven life have succeeded against all odds. God called this black Nigerian to build the largest church in Europe. Ukraine is not as culturally diverse as America is. They do not readily follow people who are black. Simply because of his race, Pastor Sunday encountered an immense amount of opposition. Yet, God always makes a way for us to fulfill those things he calls us to accomplish. God has caused Pastor Sunday to flourish. What God is doing through Pastor Sunday is changing the face of Ukraine and is beginning to spread around the world. In front of you are the principles that allow this incredible impact for the kingdom to happen. Millions of people are coming into the kingdom and millions of people then find their destiny impacting society with the principles of the kingdom. These principles will impact culture and our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in politics, and in every dimension of society. I see the harvest. I have said, Here I am, God, please send me. Help me to fulfill my destiny of bringing people into the kingdom and seeing those people use kingdom principles to change society, causing more people to come into the kingdom of God. Use me to be a history maker. Use me to change history. This is why I am lending my voice to this book. It is an important tool to help us fulfill our destiny. I can see you in my mind's eye saying, Here I am, God, please send me. Come, together let's change how history will be written for the glory of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Johnny Bergeson, Founder, President of Kingdom.com, Philadelphia, USA, August 2015. Introduction Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews 12.28 During his earthly ministry, Jesus preached only the gospel of the kingdom. He came to the earth to restore the kingdom of God to the world. In contrast, the church has been preaching the gospel of salvation for decades, teaching believers to take refuge in the church, avoid the world, and eventually escape from it. This faulty gospel has reduced the church to a personal remedy and unhealthy escape mechanism rather than the total answer to mankind's total need that it is meant to be. Not only did Jesus himself preach the kingdom of God, but he declared, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 13. 
It is possible that the rapture, which Christians are waiting for, will not happen until the church gets it right, until it leaves the escapist gospel and preaches the gospel of the kingdom to every nation. Only this gospel is powerful enough to restore the reign of the king. Regardless of culture, false religions, and other seemingly impossible barriers to the truth. By definition, the word kingdom refers to the domain where a king rules. It is not enough for Christ to rule in your heart or the hearts of fellow church members. That is not the ultimate domain of the king of kings. Christ is not the light of the church. He is the light of the world. John 8.12 His lordship must be reflected not just in developing his character within you, but also in your taking his light to the lost souls in the world, on your job, into your community, your nation, and the nations of the earth. The scriptures declare that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, Romans 14, 17. These characteristics of the kingdom are not meant to be demonstrated only by believers in the environment of a cloistered church congregation. Unfortunately, they are not always evident even in church. They are not to be relegated to promoting church programs and activities while ignoring the ills of society. And the primary mandate for every believer is not to work at a job and come to church to pay tithes. It is to find your personal promised land and use it as a platform to impact society with the kingdom principles Jesus taught. Jesus means for believers to become salt and light on the earth, extending his kingdom principles, values, and lifestyle in every sphere of life, wherever we see unrighteousness and darkness prevailing. Righteousness, peace, and joy will characterize the entire society where Christians are promoting the priority, principles, and lifestyle of the kingdom of God. The increase of harvest for the eternal kingdom is an important outcome of this. Welsh youth empowered to transform their nation. For example, during the famous Welsh revival of 1904, over 100,000 new converts came to Christ, according to estimates of the time. That great move of the Spirit had very small beginnings, and yet it became a movement that quickly spread to the four corners of the world. One of the best-known leaders of the revival was Evan Roberts, a Christian youth who was an avid student of the Word and theological works of the day. He prayed regularly that God would visit his nation in revival power. Evan Roberts had a deep spiritual experience during prayer, which he shared with the young people of his church encouraging them to be open to God. This is considered a main catalyst of the revival that followed. Evan, his brother Dan, and his best friend Sidney traveled around the country sharing the power of God that was igniting their souls. Their meetings broke the conventional and bypassed the traditional. Often ministers just sat down unable to preach or even to understand what storm had arrived in their usually sedate temples. People were changed. In so many ways, the crime rate dropped, drunkards were reformed, and pubs reported losses in trade. Bad language disappeared and never returned to the lips of many. It was reported that the pit ponies failed to understand their born-again colliers who seemed to speak the new language of Zion without cursing and blasphemy. Even the national sports of football and rugby became uninteresting to fans in light of new joy and direction received by the converts. Visitors from France, Turkey, the U.S., to name but a few, came to visit and caught the flame, passing it on to their countries. Welsh communities throughout the world felt the effects of the powerful move of God, sparked by a few young people interceding for their nation, abandoning themselves to God, and sharing their good news. Their primary mandate was not to work at a job and attend church to pay tithes. They were consumed with a desire to have God transform their nation. Jesus reveals his priority. In Jesus' parables, he described the kingdom of God as a mustard seed that is capable of growing up to take over the whole forest. He also said it was like leaven that leavens the whole lump of dough, leaving no piece unchanged by its pervading presence. When leaders only preach the gospel of salvation and view the church's role merely as a personal refuge for believers, a means of escape from the godlessness of the world, 
They malign the true gospel. They reduce the supernatural power of the kingdom of God to transform and extend the kingdom throughout the earth. They make God a half-god, strong enough to change a person, but not powerful enough to influence and transform all of society. Through the power of his redemption, Christ has made believers to rule as kings on the earth. Revelation 1.6 Just as a king has a political kingdom, a domain where he reigns, so Christians are destined to extend his kingdom as they reign in this life. The life of every believer should be dedicated to reigning over their God-given territory, their personal sphere of influence. As each believer makes his priority to subdue his promised land according to the kingdom principles, the earth can be filled with the glory of the Lord. Christ's ultimate purpose is for the glory of God to be restored to the whole earth. Hence, this is the significance of Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. You are the hope for restoring the glory of God, his dominion and kingdom rule throughout the earth. That restoration of God's reign is not to be realized only in the future millennial reign of Christ. It must begin now. This is the biblical mandate of the church, the body of Christ on the earth today. There is no more important purpose for its existence. Throughout history, there are accounts of powerful revivals that transform lives, communities, and entire nations. One such account is the Great Awakening of the 1730s and beyond which began in England and swept the American colonies. It brought people back to born-again relationship with Christ from cold traditional religion. They experienced new levels of intimacy with God, which transcended denominations, class, and cultural status. Individuals, regardless of education, race, or position in life, were worthy of God's love and transforming power. Powerful preachers such as Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, as well as John Wesley and others, were responsible for large ingathering of souls during this awakening. Their sermons were based on true religion, which meant trusting biblical revelation rather than human reason. In that way, the revival counteracted the strong currents of the Age of Enlightenment rampant in Europe, which had made reason supreme. This spiritual reality, experienced in the salvation of multitudes of people, united them over political and religious divides. Some credit this revival with preparing the American colonists for their revolution in which they gained freedom from England by breaking the false notion that a state church should be honored and obeyed above God's laws of justice and liberty. Even politically, an entire nation was influenced by the gospel truths of the kingdom preached by men and women who were totally abandoned to God. They asserted that the kingdom was not for a few educated religious elite, but for individual believers who are empowered and indwelt by God himself. The Sole Mission of Jesus The scriptures teach that the mission of Jesus was twofold, to redeem mankind through his death and resurrection, and to extend the kingdom of God throughout the earth. Originally, God gave Adam the responsibility to fill the earth with God's glory. The first couple was not commanded just to multiply and fill the earth with other people. They were given the authority to subdue the earth and extend the glory they enjoyed as they walked with God. The glory of God in which they lived before they sinned was to be multiplied throughout the whole earth. His love, wisdom, power, humility, and every divine virtue were intended to characterize life on earth. Jesus, who was called the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15.45, came to restore to the earth the glorious kingdom that the first Adam forfeited. After John was put into prison, Jesus began to preach, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1.15 Jesus also declared, If I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke 11.20 it is important to note that the church had not been introduced when Jesus announced that the kingdom of God, Jesus' domain, had come to earth. It may surprise you to know that Jesus' primary assignment was not to establish the church on the earth. His primary mission was that through the church he would restore the kingdom of God and his glory to the whole world. Jesus reflected that glory in his life on earth. 
He established the righteousness of God in every situation that he touched, restoring the glory of God and bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. And that is his intent for every believer. In his model prayer, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Jesus emphatically declared this kingdom mission. After his manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 9-10 And Jesus prayed for the glory of God to fill the earth through the lives of his followers that he sends into the world. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them. John 17, verse 18 and 21 through 22. This dual mission of Jesus to redeem mankind through his death and resurrection and to restore the kingdom of God on the earth has been largely misunderstood by the church. As a result, the gospel of salvation preached today is only half a gospel. It denies the reality of the destiny of Christians to restore the glory of God and extend his kingdom principles to every sphere of life where they have influence. Because the church is not modeling the gospel of the kingdom as the biblically mandated lifestyle of believers to take the principles of the kingdom into their daily lives, our youth today are caught in a crisis of belief. Research among kids who regularly attend church reveals that young people who lack basic biblical principles as a basis for their belief system are over 200% more likely to be angry with life, resentful, lacking purpose, and will ultimately become disappointed with life. They are also much more likely to lie to a friend, steal, physically hurt someone, use illegal drugs, and attempt suicide. Instead of having strong beliefs in the absolute truths about God, salvation, moral conduct, and other kingdom themes that Jesus taught, church youth today are accepting subjective truth, in other words, what a verse of scripture means to me. These young people are hearing truth through their own filter, which tells them that all truth is personally determined. The majority of today's youth say there is no absolute moral truth. They have not believed the kingdom truth declared by Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6 The church is not the kingdom of God. Widespread confusion regarding the mandate of the church has resulted in its failure to fulfill its primary purpose, to extend the kingdom of God on the earth. Many erroneously believe that the church and the kingdom are synonymous terms. Jesus demonstrated through his teachings and lifestyle that the church and the kingdom of God, while integrally related, are not synonymous. When Christ introduced the church, he declared, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. His next words to the disciples were, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 19. It is clear that in that discourse, Jesus took the responsibility for building his church while giving his disciples the keys of the kingdom. He gave them the responsibility for extending the kingdom of heaven on the earth his righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So effective were those keys for the early Christians that people exclaimed, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Acts 17, verse 6. Many pastors have taken it upon themselves to build their church according to their pattern, their personality, and for their purposes. For them, the church consists of expensive facilities, lots of people, and providing attractive programs. The purpose of church programs is to keep their members busy and out of trouble, keep them coming to their church, and motivate them to finance more church programs. These pastors find it necessary to try to control their members, to keep them from going to another church they might find more attractive. Their churches engage in unhealthy rivalry. Pastors compete instead of cooperating striving to build the best facilities, promote the best programs in music, and to be the most popular leader. The goal is not to extend the kingdom. The goal is to build my church. 
Some leaders scarcely notice the lack of power displayed in their lives and the lives of their members to bring redemptive change to their community. And, while pastors lament over the large-scale exodus from their churches, especially among younger members, they often consider it just a sign of the times. I wrote in my book, Church Shift, the inevitable result of doing church as I have just described. Too many Christians and Christian leaders spend their energy, creativity, and precious time promoting churches instead of the kingdom. They work for the success of their church or perhaps for a group of churches in their city, or they work for their ministry or denomination. They believe that by building churches and ministries, they are building the kingdom. They think church and kingdom are practically synonymous. This isolation of the church from the world has led to ineffectiveness and failure to carry out the Great Commission. Believers who are taught to simply attend church and be involved with the weekly programs of the church become distracted in their daily lives with worldly values and goals, earning a living, enjoying recreation, and adopting many of the mindsets of today's godless society. They don't understand that their job or career is to be more than just a means of economic stability that they aren't supposed to just work for a living. They don't know that they are to discover their destiny to extend the kingdom of God, its values, principles, and lifestyle into their place of employment throughout the community and beyond. In an article titled, Americans Have Commitment Issues, new survey shows, the Barna Research Group cites what they call soft Christianity, concluding, quote, Americans are willing to expend some energy in religious activities, such as attending church and reading the Bible, and they are willing to throw some money in the offering basket. Because of such activities, they convince themselves that they are people of genuine faith. But when it comes time to truly establishing their priorities and making a tangible commitment to knowing and loving God, and to allowing Him to change their character and lifestyle, most people stop short. End quote. Purpose of the Church Through his apostles, Christ revealed the preciousness of the church and the power and purpose that is entrusted to it. According to the epistles, it is clear that God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be a head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 1.22 Husbands are admonished to love their wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 25-27 The Apostle Paul teaches all believers that they are to give honor to each other as members of Christ's body, functioning together and living in interdependency with one another to build up the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And he revealed the mandate of the five key ministry gifts of the church, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Ephesians 4.12 Paul explains that the primary purpose of church leadership is to equip believers to fulfill their destiny in answer to the heart cry of God for the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus stated clearly that he has come to seek and save that which is lost. Luke 19.10 As believers are equipped for service, they will be filled with passion to do the same, to fulfill the heart cry of the head of the church, and to seek redemption of lost souls. Only in pursuing this clear mandate can church leaders begin to establish the kingdom-driven life and become the salt and light of the world. Any lesser path results in the church functioning as an ecclesiastical dynasty hidden within four walls, reciting empty and powerless creeds of theological dogma. These practices make the church less relevant to the lives of even sincere believers in our world today. The purpose of every Christian is to be like leaven, influencing the environment where God places them until it is quietly transformed to reflect the glory of God. Without this understanding of priority and purpose, 
Much of the church has become powerless to affect the spiritual and moral darkness of the society in which we live. The church must learn to rule and reign in every area of life where believers are in order to carry the glory of God into those places. They are to become God-carriers to transform their sphere of influence, extending the principles of the kingdom there. According to sociologists, there are seven major spheres of life which are categorized generally as following. 1. Spiritual social. 2. Government politics. 3. Business economy. 4. Education and science. 5. Media. 6. Culture entertainment. 7. Sports. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, so that he would know how to conduct himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 All of society is to feel the powerful transforming influence of this pillar and ground of the truth, the church. In order for the glory of God to fill all the earth, it is necessary that the truth and the principles of his kingdom become pillars upon which all of society rests. Priority of the Kingdom Jesus articulated the priority of the kingdom, the Father's divine heartbeat, when he taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6.10 True disciples of Christ will be motivated with the passion of God's heart to restore his kingdom, his will, his power, and his glory in all the earth. The godliness demonstrated in the realm of heaven must become the reality of earth. Extending the principles of the kingdom of heaven throughout the earth, throughout all of society, is the mandate of the church, of every believer. The ministry of reconciling people personally to God increases the number of people who carry God's glory throughout the earth. What does this divine priority, the heartbeat of God, look like in the 21st century? It means that every believer must learn to occupy his or her promised land as the children of Israel were assigned to do. As they routed the beasts and the giants dwelling in the promised land, they possessed it, subduing it to the will of God. Exodus 23. They did not huddle together in their tribes and allow their inhabitants of the land and the beasts of the field to rule over them. Jesus' priority of the kingdom is missing in many churches today. Instead of the passion to establish kingdom principles and values on the earth, we see an attitude of apathy and lack of motivation, even defeat, in many churchgoers and church leaders. Churchgoers and leaders have some sense of saving people from the domain of darkness, but little sense of being saved to fulfill our kingdom purposes. It is almost like people think our salvation is punctuated by a pause while we await our eternal purposes in heaven. Demonstrating the Kingdom of God The influence of the Kingdom of God is ordained and destined to cover and impact the entire earth. It is the mustard seed that becomes the largest tree providing shelter for the birds of the air. Matthew 13.31 It is the leaven that leavens the whole lump, penetrating every sphere of society with godly principles. Matthew 13.33 It is the river of God dwelling within every believer that satisfies the lost, thirsty souls. John 7.38 As the founding pastor of the largest church in Europe, I can testify to the redemptive, transforming power of these biblical principles for extending the kingdom of God on the earth. Twenty-one years ago, I began with seven people, and today, besides the 25,000 members of our church, over two million souls have given their hearts to Christ at our altar. And there are about 1,000 churches that have been established through our ministry, with many reaching into other nations as well. Our church was not established through popularity or media coverage or large endowments. On the contrary, as a young black man from Nigeria, I suffered the prejudice of race that is rampant in this country. The government accused me of being a leader of a cult, of controlling people and other absurdities. They tried to kick me out of the country, but God's will prevailed. Jesus is building his church in our former communist nation as we dare to train and equip believers to apply the principles of the kingdom and extend the values of the kingdom in their sphere of influence. Our church was established through the transforming power of God that changed lives one at a time as we demonstrated and taught the principles of the kingdom that Jesus taught. 
Demonstrating and teaching these kingdom principles has resulted in our church establishing over 3,000 autonomous organizations in our nation, led by members of our church, with many being sponsored and not financed by the government. Believers are wielding their godly influence through practical programs accepted and sponsored throughout our city, our nation, and in other nations of the world. Our members have invaded even the political system and are serving our nation's government in a godly way to bring reforms and extend values and lifestyles based on kingdom principles. Do not be tempted to think that the impact we are having in our nation is a phenomenon or that it is God's time just for Ukraine. I encourage you not to dismiss these testimonies as powerful examples of what is happening only within our cultural paradigm. Kingdom principles apply to the church worldwide and release their supernatural transforming power for all believers who embrace them. Empowering You As I mentioned, according to the scriptures, the focus of church leadership, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The Apostle Paul wrote, Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full-grown in the Lord. Ephesians 4, 12-13 To that end, as a pastor, I have written The Kingdom Driven Life to help empower church leaders and believers alike to embrace the revelation of the Kingdom of God. The church must learn to reflect the personality of God on the earth, his nature, and his characteristics as they are witnessed in the lifestyle of believers. Jesus did not come simply to save us from sin, but to give us abundant life. John 10.10 He is not a half-God. He is absolute. He came to restore his righteousness to the domain of the earth and extend the influence of his kingly domain now, not only in his future millennial reign. He gives believers authorization to reign as kings and priests on the earth, to do greater works than he did, and to fill the earth with his glory. To that end, the church must fulfill its mandate to multiply the number of believers and to equip believers to extend the kingdom of God in the world. Are you a pastor or leader who longs to see the kingdom of God extended on the earth? Are you a believer who desires to do the will of God? Do you desire to fulfill your divine destiny? Are you lacking zeal and passion for the kingdom? These life questions must be answered honestly by every Christian leader and believer. You may have wondered if a believer needs to receive Jesus Christ, making him preeminent in our life, making him Lord, embracing the kingdom of God in our inner being, before he can be regarded as saved. However, on the other hand, the question could be asked, Is it possible to have brought salvation to a believer without necessarily having had made Jesus Christ our Lord without making the truth about the kingdom of God part of us? For the purposes of the invasion of the kingdom of God on the earth, God in his wisdom purposefully designed our process of salvation in such a way that it requires us to receive Jesus Christ and participate in his kingdom. He does this by making every believer to become a God-carrier and a person who extends the kingdom. The sole purpose for receiving Jesus Christ is not just for appearance, to wear a badge of salvation, or just for fun. It is because God needed someone who would actually carry his life and reflect him on a daily basis, revealing him to as many as have not discovered him. So his kingdom assignment to us is intimately linked with our very salvation. In the same vein, the reason we receive the kingdom of God inside of us when we are born again is that it is an integral part of the life of any believer to not just carry the kingdom of God, but to actually extend the kingdom and work for its progress wherever he or she goes. However, This kingdom aspect of our salvation and our Christian life is often neglected. Not very many believers connect their salvation to the mandate of revealing God and extending the kingdom of God through each individual believer. This is what God wishes to restore back to the modern church today. Some might wonder if the kingdom of God is already within you, as I explained in the first chapter. Why do we still need to receive Jesus and the good news of his kingdom at salvation? 
The importance is we need to understand that the whole creation is created according to the principles and laws of the kingdom. The laws that govern creation and humans on the earth are in accordance with the principles and the nature of the kingdom of God. If we don't understand the good news of the kingdom, we cannot convey it. However, we individually still need to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, thereby receiving the regeneration of our spirits. It is that Spirit of Christ that causes our spirits to be born again. Without that Spirit, there would be no grace to live according to the laws of the kingdom. So even though we are created to live by love, no one would be able to live in love without the Spirit and the grace of God. Even though man and the creation are made to function according to the laws of the kingdom, yet no one would be able to fully live by these laws without the Spirit of Christ and His grace indwelling them. However, even when a person is born again, he or she will still need to study the Word of God to become consciously aware of these laws of the kingdom by which he was created to function. In other words, even though we are created to function by the laws of the kingdom, a person will find it difficult to be aware of that or know the laws until he renews his mind through the direct work of the Spirit or through biblical studies that will enable the laws to come to reality in his life. At times, people discover the principles of the kingdom at work to successfully manage businesses or relationship issues or other things. We should realize that the principles work because they are the laws and principles of the kingdom that apply to all people. The laws and the principles of the kingdom become effectual in our personal lives as we renew our minds with the word of God and exercise the discipline to embrace the image of Christ. Only in this way can we effectively carry the kingdom, his life and principles, to the outside world. As you dare to embrace these kingdom principles, you too will become an effective God-carrier on the earth, and the powerful life-changing testimonies that follow will inspire even the most discouraged Christian leader and believer to believe that you too can become a powerful force to extend God's kingdom on earth in our generation.